Dun, da, da, da. Looks good. The best thing about the ragu sauce, not the pasta, is that it's even better the next day, which means more ragu for me tomorrow. And you might be wondering, is she gonna add garlic? Well, no. Ooh, that one is really nice. Hey everyone, it's Nia with the Food 52 Test Kitchen, and today we're making a short rib ragu. It's super easy, it doesn't require a whole lot of ingredients. It's an amazing make-ahead recipe. It's also great for serving a crowd. If you're having a dinner party, it's just one of my favorites, and yeah, let's begin. Um, okay, so I, I have here my bone-in short ribs. This is about two pounds. Um, you could use three pounds, you could use a pound and a half. It really is kind of like up to you and how many people you're gonna serve. This recipe with all the other ingredients that I have, it's pretty lenient, so it doesn't have to be super specific, which I really like. So sometimes I make this with three pounds. Today I'm making it with two. Turn on this to medium high. I'm also using this heavy bottom soap coquette. It's really important that you use a heavy bottom pan because it's gonna be cooking for about three hours. So you wanna make sure that none of the food on the bottom is gonna burn. And then you also wanna make sure to have a solid lid to kind of keep the moisture locked in. So I'm preheating that a little bit now. I'm gonna add about two tablespoons of olive oil. And so now I'm gonna make sure to get salt on all the sides of the short rib. Okay, so I actually forgot to pat the meat dry, which is the first step. So I know I already salted one side, but I just flipped them over and I'm patting the other side dry. Patting it dry is important because you're trying to remove as much moisture as possible from the meat before browning them. Um, the less moisture that's on the meat when you start browning, the less time it's gonna take for the actual browning to take place. And what the salt does is it draws out more moisture, which then kind of becomes a salty brine, which is also then gonna get reabsorbed by the meat and is gonna help to tenderize the meat during the cooking process. Just do like a generous pinch on all sides. You can also add a little bit of pepper. This is the Stone Pepper Mill by Holcomb. It's really, really nice and it comes out from the sides here, which is cool. And on the bottom, you can adjust the size of the pepper. So now that this is kind of smoky, I'm gonna start to sear these, probably in batches. So I'm gonna do half of these. And I'm gonna do them kind of like fatty side down. If you don't wanna use short rib, you could use pork, you could use veal, lamb, it's really up to you. This recipe works great either way. So these are gonna sear for about four to five minutes until they're super nice and golden brown on the bottom. And then we're gonna flip them over and repeat it on the second side. You wanna make sure not to touch it while you're doing this because that can kind of interrupt the browning process. And they'll also release from the bottom of the pan as soon as they're done. I also choose to use bone in because the bone helps to add a lot of flavor and tenderize the meat. So you can see there's also a lot of fat around the bone, which kind of acts as like an insulator for the meat. And the bone also has bone marrow in it, which is gonna kind of seep out of the bone and also add like kind of a sweet and umami flavor, which is really nice. Ooh, that's looking nice. So you can see here, there's some nice browning going on, which is the Maillard reaction. And the Maillard reaction is when it's a chemical reaction between the amino acids and reducing sugars. And that's gonna cause the really nice browning that you see. And that's the same for like any type of brown food. So even like on cookies with like sugar and butter and on burgers. And yeah, and that's gonna create really nice flavor that we're gonna then scrape up into the sauce. Ooh, that one is really nice. And they're obviously not gonna be cooked at all in the middle, but that's what we're putting them in the oven for. So it's gonna cook for like three hours. Okay, so my second batch of meat is finally done cooking. They look really, really nice. You can see that there's a decent amount of fat left in the pot and that's all the fat that's been rendered from the bones. We wanna leave that in there because fat equals flavor. I'm gonna turn this down to low heat actually. So I'm gonna set these aside. Now I'm gonna make our sofrito. So this is two cups red onion one cup of celery, one cup of chopped carrots. Think low and slow when you're cooking this. So it's gonna cook for about 10 to 15 minutes until almost translucent and super soft and really aromatic. And you might be wondering, is she gonna add garlic? Well, no, I'm not. Because traditionally in Italy, a bolognese doesn't have garlic. I don't really know if that's the same for ragu, but that's kind of what I went with when I was developing this recipe. If you wanna use garlic, you can. This would be the stuff to add it. 
So the main difference between a sofrito and a mirepoix is that a mirepoix is traditionally used in a lot of French cooking. Sofrito is for cuisines like Italian and Spanish. A mirepoix is made out of the three main ingredients, so onion, celery, and carrots. And a sofrito is made out of three, but can also use other vegetables like red peppers or things like that. Even though this still only uses three ingredients, we're calling it a sofrito because this is an Italian dish. Okay, these are looking super nice. Now I'm gonna add one can, six ounces of tomato paste. I'm gonna use this really cool little spatula. Um, if you didn't know, I actually just learned this recently that this little divot in it is for cans. So it's to get that like extra little stuff around the edges, which is really handy. So I'm gonna saute this until it's nice and brick red. And what this does is it kind of reduces the acidity in the tomato and it makes it a little bit more caramelized and sweet and it's really good. So I'm gonna saute this for just a minute or two. I really like using tomato paste because it's such a concentrated tomato flavor. Okay, this is looking pretty good. It's also kind of starting to stick a little bit to the bottom of the pan, which means that some of the moisture is starting to disappear. Now I'm gonna deglaze it with some red wine. You could really, in theory, deglaze with anything. It could be broth, it could be water, it could be wine. Love using red wine for this. So this is about a cup. This is gonna cook just for a minute until some of that strong alcohol flavor has disappeared. I did a study abroad program in Italy when I was in college and I ate so much ragu and bolognese. It was the best thing and yeah, it was just amazing. So now whenever I cook any Italian dish, I always reminds me of that. So now we're gonna keep building our sauce. So I have two cups of beef broth. Um, you could use bouillon, so you would use two teaspoons of bouillon and two cups of water instead. Give that a little stir. So now I'm gonna add the meat. So just snuggle it into the sauce. And you can see here, the fat and the meat has already started to separate from the bone, which is kind of cool. So now I'm also gonna add sage, and I also have fresh rosemary and also Parmesan rind. You don't have to add Parmesan rind, but I feel like it adds a really nice flavor. Um, and you could also experiment with any types of herbs, so you could add parsley, oregano, you could add bay leaves would be good. Um, I really like this recipe because it's very like method-based, so it doesn't have to be super specific. You should feel free to experiment and use ingredients that are accessible to you. I have also preheated the oven to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Now it's time to put this in the oven. And I actually prefer to use a kitchen towel over like oven mitts for some reason. These are by Time and Sage, they're 100% cotton. They're really cute, it comes in three different ones. I love them, they're the perfect size. And so this is now gonna cook for about three hours. One thing that I like to do at around the hour and a half mark is to just open the lid, make sure that there's still enough liquid in there. And if you need more liquid, you can add a little broth or just some water and then pop it right back in. So the ragu is almost done. I also have some water boiling because we're gonna boil some pasta. I choose to use these, I'm not gonna even try to pronounce that, but they're really big rigatoni pretty much. Um, I really love these because they trap the sauce on the inside and it's really great. You could use the wide tagliatelle pasta or really any pasta that you want. So I'm gonna take the ragu out of the oven. Mmm, it smells so good. Ugh. It's bold cooking like a tomato-based sauce in a white pot. Dun da da da. She looks good. Mmm, she smells good too. You can tell too that the meat is done because I just so easily pulled this bone right out. Discard all the bones and then also the herbs. If you have a little extra herbs that like you can't get out, that's totally fine. Like some rosemary pieces. I'm gonna put my discard bowl right here. And now I'm gonna transfer out all the meat into another bowl and I'm gonna shred it in here. And this is when you kind of notice all the really fatty parts that sit around the bone. Those I'm definitely gonna remove. I love a ragu. I especially love this recipe because it's so easy. It really doesn't require that many ingredients. Not a ton of technique. Like, it's really hard to mess up. And it's perfect for like a Sunday when you don't really feel like doing a lot of cooking. You can just pop it in the oven and let it sit for a while. Now it's time to shred. I would recommend letting this cool for a few minutes because it is really, really hot. 
um, especially if you want to shred it with your hands. I like to use gloves for this part. So actually, we're going to pause there. I'm going to boil the pasta because water is boiling. So cook your pasta per the directions on the box, but drain it about two minutes or a minute before it gets to al dente because it's going to continue cooking a little bit in the sauce. Okay, so now I'm just going to start shredding. I personally like to shred it into pretty small pieces. You can leave bigger chunks if you want. These are the really, really thick pieces of weird fat that you want to remove, but they do hold on to meat really well, so make sure you get that off. No meat to waste. You can be like a stickler and remove all the fat. I like to like leave whatever isn't in like big chunks in, honestly. I really just grab a piece and then pull with other fork. Okay, now I'm gonna add the shredded meat back in to the sauce and mix it together. Mmm, yum. We got the, all the pieces of carrot, celery, once it's in the pot too, you could use the back of a spoon to make the pieces even smaller if you want. So as you might've noticed, we didn't really salt a ton throughout. The majority of the salt really came just from the beginning. So now would be a good time to taste the sauce and add more salt and pepper um, if you think it needs it. Mm. It's really good. I am gonna add a little bit more salt, just like a generous pinch. We have also salted the pasta water, so there's also gonna be some salt from that as well. A Little bit of freshly ground black pepper. I'm really excited for this because this means that I don't have to make dinner tonight. And that's always a good thing. So now we're just waiting on the pasta and then we're gonna add the pasta to the ragu. Okay, so before I pour the pasta out, I'm gonna reserve about three fourths of a cup. I usually don't end up using all of it, but it's nice to have extra. It's always important to have a higher ratio of sauce than pasta, I think. I mean, I feel like most people would think, but especially with the ragu, because you really want it to be like super saucy and nobody likes a dry pasta. This is also a really great make-ahead recipe because you could make the ragu and throw it in the freezer. Um, and then whenever you're feeling like having ragu for dinner, you could just boil some pasta and thaw the sauce and then you have yourself a instant ragu. I'm gonna go in with some Parmesan. I feel like any Italian type of pasta or any pasta at all for that matter is not complete without some grated Parmesan on top. I like to finish off this ragu with a little bit of fresh parsley. There we have it. Super, super easy short ragu with big rigatoni. So excited to dig in. I did make it now, but one thing that I actually really love to serve on the side is like a fresh arugula salad with arugula, some shaved Parmesan, olive oil, a little bit of lemon juice and salt and pepper. Super easy and I find it just cuts the richness of this dish, which is, which is a really nice touch and also again, super easy to throw together. Okay, it's just me tasting today, but I'm not mad about it. Just as good as the last 10 times I made it. <laughs> no, but I actually really, really like this recipe. Super easy. I love the rigatoni. I love how soft the carrots are and the meat is so tender and so flavorful. Um, and the Parmesan is just the cherry on top, obviously. Thank you for watching Recipe Drop. Please let me know if you tried this recipe. I hope you enjoy it. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.